guitarist Adam Rogers. Adam, it's great to see you. It's great to see you too, Scott. Always my pleasure. Thank you. You know, what's going on in the career of Adam Rogers? <clears throat> well, I am uh, working on a new record for a group of mine that's called Dice. I'm working with two great musicians in that group, uh, Nate Smith on the drums, Fim Efron on the bass, and we just recorded um, an album in Avatar Studios here in New York City. And um, I am working with uh, other musicians that I've worked with for years in the, in the jazz world, namely saxophonist Chris Potter and saxophonist Robbie Coltrane. I'm going out to uh, play at the San Francisco Jazz Festival with Robbie to celebrate the 50th anniversary of his father's album, A Love Supreme, John right. Coltrane's A Love Supreme. What's that song? Is it the thing you do for Porgy and Bess? I Loves You Porgy? I Loves You Porgy, yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I, the first time I ever saw you play, you did that. And I was oh, like, yeah? I'm like, I'm sitting here, I'm thinking like, again, like I'm that knucklehead that says like, as soon as I hear Porgy and Bass, I go, eh, what am I doing here like that, you know? And then, <laughs> and then to, to, just to sit through it is a thing, <clears throat> to be blown away by it, it's just like, you know, that just, I just realized my own ignorance. How do you get well, into something? You're not something? that ignorant if it does something to you. you know? No, 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 just to have never been even right. open to being exposed to it. Right. That's what I mean by that. Like, it's once I've heard it, how could you not admire it? But to not even want to even know that door existed to open, right? How did you get into jazz? How did jazz become, like, you know, your thing? I don't really know exactly. My father, both of my parents were, were Broadway performmers, among other things. My father was a singer-dancer in the original Oklahoma in the 40s oh, wow. here on Broadway. My mother was in Hello, Dolly, Once Upon a Mattress, all kinds of wow. shows. A lot of the, the what are called jazz standards, like I Love You Porgy, right. come from Broadway shows and movies. That's right. what a lot of the what people refer to as the Great American Songbook comes from. I started uh, playing piano and drums when I was a little kid. I mean, like How five, five, six years old. Wow! My father would show me little things on the piano. And Did you take to it right away? Or? As I remember, I was really into it, yeah. What I'm constantly looking for as a listener for music is to basically have that same experience when I did when I was five or six, which is to hear something and go, With what all is that, that you know now? Well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's why I became a musician out of that, that I don't want to say innocent fascination or um, obsession session with something that I heard that I didn't really understand that mystified me and made me feel something or impressed me. You know, I mean, music, you can understand music on a lot of different levels. What I look for as a listener is something that moves me in right. some way emotionally. And music is a very, very complex thing. So there's no limit. I mean, the combination of all the variables available to a composer and instrumentalist are infinite to this day. They both, my father is in his 80s, he plays piano all the time. It's amazing. That He's always so trying to cool. call me up and asking me, because he knows, you know, as a jazz musician, I had to, I didn't have to, but I learned all these standards, they call them, like right. I Love You Porgy, right, like right, right, right. all of me, like all the things, right. you know, all these tunes. My father and mother both know all those tunes and they can sing all the lyrics to them. So if they ever come and hear me play, be and honest. I do something, my mother will go, come on, man. <laughs> like, I love you, Corgi. There's a part in it goes, I love da 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 There's one note that's a very chromatic note in the key. It's an F sharp in F. And my mother always says, you gotta, she goes, you gotta make a bigger deal out of that note because it's so dramatic. 
And I just love that, you know, that she's like, you know, she knows this music better than I do. Well, you remember who you're talking, when you're saying F sharp, you're talking maybe to the people out there because I know it phonetically, that's it. There's one note in the, in the melody that's an F sharp. It's one half step above. It's like the most uh, dissonant note you could play in the key of F. And yet right. Gershwin wrote it and it's so beautiful and elegant the way he plays it that you wouldn't even notice it. It doesn't sound like, whoa, what's that note? But it's a note that you should really play with intent in the thing because it's, you know, it's important. And my mother will want, and my father would do the same thing. Like, you know, I, I think there are times where I've played where he goes, what do you, why don't you just play the melody more like he wrote it? So, you know, somebody who's maybe into Broadway sort of interpretations might hear a jazz musician who takes a lot more liberties and go, right. what are you doing so much with the melody? Just play the melody like the composer wrote it. So sometimes my father will say if he's right, being right, 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 right. What are you doing? Do you think that musicians are born or, or they can, you know, and this question is, you know, anybody, I, I, dude, I sing in the shower, the water will stop running. It's not pretty. It's really, I'm really sure that's not anybody okay. who knows me, this is for those who don't. But um, so, but I love music, man. But could somebody who is, isn't born with certain gifts, can that stuff be taught to them? What do you I, think? I, I mean, don't, I really don't know. I mean, I... Because it seems I, like you were born with, you know, you come from both musical parents, I mean, right? Well, you know, one could say that, uh, yeah, I mean, both of my parents were musical. Um, had I been, you know, raised by another family, would I have been as interested in music? No, but you genetically, know, it's you have, you know, the, their genes. So, so they say. I don't. <laughs> I listen. I, I'm not a scientist, right. but I try to think about things scientifically yeah, yeah, to yeah. an extent. So, if I don't have enough information to really formulate okay, a reliable, but, okay, opinion, and so I that, really. I've always been able to pick things up pretty fast in music, I think just from this general, you know, ability that I've either, you know, was we born said, with. acquired or <laughs> nurture or nature. I just remember being f completely floored yeah. by this Hendrix record, yeah. you know, with some kind of energy that I really, sort of like what I said, I didn't understand it, right. but something about it just really, really bowled me over. This, and it wasn't just the guitar or the song, it was like this cool, electric man. spirit, you know? Yeah. And I, you know, became really obsessed with trying to learn how to play like he played. I bought whatever Hendrix, you know, Are You Experienced Man, The Gypsies, Electric Ladyland, The Live Stuff, whatever you could get. And so I got all this stuff, these really weird recordings like Hendrix in the studio, Hendrix playing, and parks like before he got really famous and all this stuff and I just listened to it all day long and sort of started to figure out what he, sort of the language that he was playing. I just tried to figure out how to play like Hendrix you know right which, you know, I could do a pretty, as a 14-year-old kid, I could do, I have tapes of me jamming with my friends, and I got some of it, you know, I was so obsessed with the it. The early Adam Rogers recordings? Are they the earliest? I th yeah, I have this one right? cassette. This, this guy, Toby, played alto saxophone, and all he did was read Charlie Parker solos out of this book. He, I, he didn't improvise, he didn't, all he did was, and he would sort of, um, say denigrating things about the fact that I couldn't play, I couldn't read, I couldn't play jazz, I didn't understand this music. We would get into arguments about jazz versus Hendrix. I mean, I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I started studying with a jazz guitar teacher at this time who would also sort of lambast me for my lack of this technical This guy told me planted the seed though with you. Well, he didn't really, he, well, how he planted the seed was he would just play these Charlie Parker records for me and John Coltrane records. And I started to become really fascinated with but by him. his remarks, was he pushing your buttons a little bit, challenging you a little yeah, bit? Yeah, he pissed me off. Yeah. yeah. But he didn't know anything either. All he knew how to play, <laughs> he could just read Let it go, solos. Adam, let it go. <laughs> he would read solos. 
He didn't, I don't even know if he knew that Charlie Parker improvised. Earlier, I had been around jazz music my whole life, whether I knew what it was or, right. you know. So, something about this music started to really intrigue me. Everything at the end of the day is in the musician and how much nuance somebody brings to something. Right. But the technical requirements to be able to play jazz music are pretty massive. Like you really yeah. have to know your instrument in yeah. crazy kind of ways just to be able to move through all the keys and anyway, without going into some yeah, more yeah, technical yeah. stuff. So having said that, this music that like Charlie Parker, which was recorded in the 40s and 50s, he died in 55. And we're talking now 1980, 1981. I'm hearing all of this. Right. Because of the technical information in the music, this this music sounded like this music from the future to me. I've always had the quality, it's not unique to me, but once I decide I'm gonna do something or figure it out, it's getting done. you can't stop, you'd have to, right. you'd have to take me out. John Coltrane right. sold a lot of records. Right, 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 John right. Coltrane was a very smart, from what I understand, business person. You know, at the end of his the last couple of years of, of his life, he was playing what people generally refer to as free jazz, like very avant-garde, kind of experimental free jazz, but had, had a tremendous amount of success. He made this record called My Favorite Things in the right. early 60s, oh, yeah. which was an incredible jazz oh record, God, but it yeah. also happened to be a big selling record right. for a jazz record, like a lot. And his... One of his other seminal albums, A Love Supreme, that we're going to celebrate the 50th anniversary of, was a huge selling record. I mean, it was one of the most forward-thinking records of its time still to this day. It's incredible, but people bought it. But you're also talking about the 1960s, right? where people were into some hip shit. Yeah. But even right. when they, all that, you know, the sort of summer of love, Sgt. Peppers, or, you know, that, that mind expanding also combined with some, you know, some illicit uh, substances. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> but people were into mind expansion. Yes. Both through, you know, chemicals yeah. and art. And it's reflected in what was popular with that generation of people. Music was different than being on the road and, you know. Well, also, you know, the people that you're talking about are, were African-American guys who were doing this. In the 50s and 60s. I yeah. mean, I yeah. Mean, that just in itself is something yeah. that's really. Yeah. Like this, uh, yeah, how you could just overlook that. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, that was a real... Yeah. And these guys were... I mean, it's not that I... I um, we, that's not the primary source of certainly why I admire them, but also, you know, when in looking back, and, and I teach oftentimes as well, and, you know, I try to get a lot of students today who don't understand these historical challenges that people had and to right. say you know you got to look at what these guys were doing just from a musical standpoint and say this is amazing I mean John Coltrane did this at this time nobody had done anything like this right. at all and also Which is what Hendrix did by the way too yeah, yeah. I mean nobody and did it also before. he was a black man in America trying to do this in the late 50s yeah you know, I mean, I don't mean to bring that thing into That's stuff, a fact, though, right? Dude, it's not like, man, right. It's not like some kid yeah. now come, oh, let me study a yeah. little jazz. You know, it's like, this was a real... The culture was different, yeah. man. It just was. So, and the music... If you're an honest person and an honest musician, well, even if you're not, how you play music is going to reflect your personality. You know, if all you are is an imitator, you got really yeah. nothing to say... I think everybody can find something to say. And that's what you're doing. That's an indication of your personality that you're maybe you're afraid to do this. Or Ultimately, the way you play music will reflect who you are. And, and all the great, I mean, you, you know, anybody from Bach to Beethoven to Muddy yeah. Waters to Hendrix to John Coltrane to Stravinsky, at the end of the day, the music expresses the, the the sort of personality subtext. That's what it's about. That's what you get from these people. The reason you like, t name anybody who you really love. I don't care, rock and roll, jazz. Uh, there's so many. Stevie Ray Vaughan. Okay. Example, great Stevie Ray player. Vaughan had a <laughs> strong personality. You don't play like that. A little bit. Yeah. yeah. You don't play like that. You know, just watch videos of him, the way oh, he man. hits the guitar. Yeah, you know, yeah, that yeah. guy was an yeah, intense yeah, yeah. dude who had a lot of 
he had a lot of stuff going on in him. Influenced and, by Jimmy Dill. Of course, hugely. Way. And yeah. of, by Albert King and Mike right. Waters and all that stuff. But all those, the great guys, you know, you don't play like that if you don't have something to say. I'm sorry. I mean, it sounds like a, a really, yeah, you know, I, I, kind yeah. of overcooked adage. But I think it's true, you know? That, yeah, that's, that, yeah. John Coltrane was not... John Coltrane was John Coltrane partially because... He was an extraordinarily virtuosic saxophonist who extended music, pushed music forward both compositionally, technically, saxophonistically. Right. But the reason that all of it is so powerful is because of who he was as a person. Right. Because what informs his music yeah. is this the subtext, it's what's underneath. And that's what, you know, he died two, when I was two years old. When I put on a train record now and I listen to it, it's just, you know, it could have been recorded next week right there's a lot of power there they're ripping it from somewhere inside yeah it, it can't be you can't be fake with that it is i don't yeah i mean i don't think so you know i i don't think that if you if you try to do that in some way that's not real you know i mean you could you could you you, you can play with a lot of energy you can really wow people you can do all kinds of stuff in music but there's something to me about the stuff that sounds really real um, that you know hits you in the sort of solar plexus before it even gets to your brain where you're going okay I like this because of a B and C it's just like whoa right and that could be anything you know I mean yeah at the end of the day Scott I think that whether you play classical music jazz music you know it has to be powerful in some way yeah. I don't really think it matters what kind of music you play yeah but what's required, no matter what the level of complexity in the music is, is that you convey something to somebody. That, 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 what you're conveying could be, you know, I love you, it could be F you, it could be anything. It's just something, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look at, you know, the like 70s and early 80s, like punk rock. You know, I mean, I love a lot of that music and those guys, I mean, a lot of, I think, some of the overarching things that were going on was like, these guys didn't know how to play their instruments well. It had nothing to do with that, but they learned how to play it well enough to put across this very powerful thing that was really raw. In the same way that in blues music, you know, a blues is a three chord thing. Right. It's not that complicated. Typically guys will play with one, you know, over one scale, over these three chords. But there's only one Muddy Waters, there's only one Elmore James, there's right. only one Stevie Ray Vaughan for a reason. Yeah. Because like we were saying before, yeah. it's about, and this is the same thing with jazz, even though the, the technical requirements are m more varied and multifarious, at the end of the day, it's about who you are. Yeah. Sun House, you know, the great Delta yeah. Blues sure. player. I mean, yeah, the music, yeah. I mean, it's hard to play that music, but it's not... There's one Sun House. It's not for no reason that Sun House is a is a right a major historical figure in music because he was fucking incredible. Right. And not because he could play fifty thousand scales in twelve different time signatures. Great Charles. I mean, these kind of greats. There was something in the way they sang a song and told the story yeah. that I felt that there are people I have heard that I think. That's a natural phenomenon, one that has been refined and developed and yeah, practiced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, oh, yeah. But when you hear someone play in a certain way, you know, it's like you could never, like if I listen to George Benson, for example, right. the guitarist George Benson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time I hear him play, Tim, it sounds like, you know, this is an incredibly inarticulate way of describing it. It sounds like a flock of birds to me. It's just like, it's just something that sounds like a stream. You know, it's just so natural. And he knows everything he needs to know to play, but there's something there that's... You can't really learn how to do that. It's not something you learn. I no, it's probably... Do, so did you, would you sum it all up in saying that certain people are, you know, especially gifted, and they put in the time, and, and, it, and the combination of all of that 
it's, it's a combination of a lot of different factors There's that are all necessary. There's so many variables. Right, here. but they're I mean, all necessary. Right, I would say them... so, yeah. I mean, but I, I could be proven wrong in that someone picks up a guitar I mean, every six months. It's so safe, man. You well, can't. but I don't, I can't, I can't <laughs> say anything. I don't have enough data really about anything in life except a couple of things in my own experience <laughs> to say conclusively, no, 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 when no. this happens, this also happens. Yeah. In my experience, based on what I've seen, it seems like if you have natural gifts. <laughs> I feel like that trial lawyer. I'll push your buttons, dude. No, I'm, I, you know, most of the time I don't think that's the case because to play an instrument involves its athletic ability. Too, oh, yeah. You know, and you have, to, yeah. you have to develop your muscles or else your fingers won't do what oh, you want. Oh, absolutely. I, sit, I, I sometimes I just watch it. How are you still doing that? And that's what you do, so yeah. you do it. But I mean, to yeah, me, you do it, it, I've been doing it every day for over yeah, it's natural years. to you. It's natural, but like I said, I literally I do it every day, and I've been doing it every day since I was eleven. Right. So something's going to happen, even if you just you're not very good. You're going to have something if you've been doing it for that long. Right. If you have some of this natural ability that we're referring to, right. you're probably going to get pretty darn good right. if you work on it that hard. You know, I mean, there's only so much polishing you could do if you don't have anything going right. on. Right. If you <laughs> practice for 35 years, it's still not going to be right. 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 Yeah, I mean, the more you yeah. do something, the better you get. It could be a cabinet maker, it could be a but you also put your balls on the wall and just saying, this is yeah. what I'm going to do. There is no backup. Right. Plan. You don't learn how to play from sitting in a room practicing all the time. you got to practice get all the time. There, you got to play gigs yes. and you got to play records. That's where you see, that's where all the experiments come to fruition or don't. That's, that's the atom smasher. That's the only way to learn how to, how to gig, is to get out there and gig. There's nothing, there's no shortcut. No, and like you're no saying, other. a shortcut would be obvious. You'd be, you'd be like exposing yourself, that, you know. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's like anything. If you want to play football, you don't just go to practice. You right. got to play football games. Yeah. Right. So I mean, more than buying the cleats. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I think that's the case with anything. I mean, certainly with something that is, it is actually physical yeah. and emotional and psychological. And it requires that you, you do it in its sort of final place. How about the fact it? that it requires getting out there and not having it? You know, falling down on your face and the willingness to do that. That's a big step too. That, that, it is, that and that's that. inevitable that you will part of the to process. To some extent, be yeah. in that situation, and that's where you learn. Okay, that's what I, I got to go back home and I got to work on this right. and this and this. And I had plenty of those experiences. I think doesn't everybody? I mean, could anybody ever say no to that? I mean, yeah. I think so. Yeah, it seems to be the greatest musicians in the world. At some point, you got to get into a situation that you're not really prepared for in order to discern what it is that you need to prepare. You've got um, the, uh, the opportunity to play with some really great world renowned musicians. Mm -hmm. Playing with the saxophonist Michael Brecker, who is somebody who I loved as a as a kid um, and I started working with him in the late 90s and that was sort of a dream come true because yeah. I just admired him so much and and he was it was truly an incredible experience yeah. musically and personally and I played a little bit with Paul Simon which was really an interesting what and did cool you do with I did one gig with him I mean we played me and Julio down by the schoolyard and the boxer and <laughs> you know to play those tunes with him on yeah. stage I was kind of like <laughs> Holy Christ, you know, that's Paul Simon. He's yeah. singing that tune that I heard, you know, when I was a little kid. You know, oh, with Walter Becker, you know, that was a great, really amazing experience in that, uh, for a number of different reasons, that he signed up to, uh, to produce the band that I co-led for 11 years, Lost Tribe's first record. Now, Walter, I mean, Steely Dan was a group that I heard on the radio constantly when I was a yeah. kid. Not only because he was, is an iconic figure and somebody whose music I, I had been exposed to a lot, but, but because he's really amazing. You know, he was a great producer. Right. You, you worked with Nora Jones. How, how cool was that? It was great. Yeah. One of the tunes that I recorded for the demo, uh, they decided to put on the record because it had that... Yeah, I heard this. It's great. Thing. Turn yeah, Me On, right? Turn Me On, yeah. Great song, man. So, and Very she, simple, but beautiful. Yeah. What a voice she has. Yeah, she's, oh my God. she's amazing. I mean, 
I would say that's probably a pretty natural gift. I don't know, but yeah, yeah that's yeah. that's kind of what I was referring to before. Is certain people like that? It's just like it's too good. I mean, you can't. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's work. Of course, there's hard work yeah. that goes into it. But that so much to work with. Yeah, I mean, she's know. got a beautiful a voice, and I've you know, she's a, a lovely person. Yeah, she um, seems really cool. Yeah, and and uh, recording with her was a groove. You know. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. And it was easy as pie because she's just. It's a great musician. Was there one like musician that you worked with that taught you about being a professional musician? The first gig that I had touring was with this um, uh, clarinetist, and I learned a tremendous amount about music from playing with him. He was sort of an old school classical guy who did not accept anything but the sort of highest level from you as a musician. And night after night. Yeah, and would explicitly express this to you if if it wasn't happening <laughs> which was hard to deal with at the time but was a tremendous learning experience and he would in a, this sort of classic way tell you what are you doing that's like old this? school before old school it yes yeah. yeah like one time for example we were in minsk belarus which was former soviet union in 1990 and he came over and he said what are you doing and I said, I'm playing scales. And he goes, no, you're not. And I went, what are, you, what are you breaking my balls for? I'm sitting here playing scales. He said, it sounds like you're, you're doing your taxes or something. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? I'm playing scales. And he goes, if you think you can practice scales with that little involvement in the way that they sound and the way that you're articulating them, you're just wasting your time. And I remember going, you know, this guy is going to drive me crazy. But totally right it's like whatever you do mm. it's you know whether you're sweeping the floor or you know figuring out a physics equation or playing a violin concerto you gotta you know it's all practicing being the best you can possibly be you know and you're yeah. you're only doing yourself a disservice by not investing yourself in everything you do a hundred percent because it it shows up everywhere absolutely and I worked with this guy whose name was Radisson Dyke. And he was a, I'm not kidding. He said, in order to work with me, I want you, you gotta do two things. Here's a physics problem. And he said, I want you to build me three beautiful boxes. And I went to the library and I tried my best to figure out this thing, which was like, in a body of water of such and such dimensions, how deep would said body of water have to be and how heavy a rock so that if you dropped it from a certain amount of feet, the ripples would go this, right? Like, but I went, he said, the I don't care, but hello. And then I went home and I built these boxes. He didn't say anything like a box for pencils, a box for moving. And I came back and he looked at the boxes and he went, wow, these are really great. And they were looked at all of my notes, which were extensive. And he said, uh, you did a great job. And I said, he said, the boxes are, are beautiful. You put a lot of time into it. And uh, you did a great job with the physics question. I said, I didn't answer it. He said, it, you can't answer it. And I said, so why'd you ask me? He said, I wanted to see at what point you'd become discouraged. Wow, brilliant. I didn't realize until later how sort of profound that was. Oh my God, yeah. And then he right? used to have me do things for him, like build boxes or sweep the floor. And you never know when him. he's setting you up. Whatever you do, you're always practicing for everything else. And I remember, you know, again, sort of being frustrated or, you know, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I learned a lot from this guy, man. He would say. Were you, you smart know, enough at that point in your life to realize? Um, how much you were learning from him? Not really, no. I mean, I had an inclination. I didn't do very well with anybody telling me anything. So, uh, authority figures... But, but I, how, I mean, both of these guys seem like hard-nosed guys, and yet you... Well, some part of me probably knew because I didn't just run away from... Yeah, but was it because they were good at what they did? Like, what made you stay with them? I don't know. So, I'm saying, okay. I, I think my, my conscious reaction was... Hey, God, what a pain in the ass this is, or this guy's right. breaking my balls. Some part of me probably knew right. that they were dropping wisdom on me. Yeah, this is something that. instinctual too, when you kind of know if somebody's breaking your balls, that there's, the intention is, is good. 
it's, yeah. it's, it's to help not to, you know, it's not their I shit. I think so, yeah. And you know? both of these guys that we're talking right. about were not masters of, you know, sort of communicating in a polite Bedside way manner. At all. No. <laughs> so that wasn't, <laughs> right. which is fine. So, I mean, you traveled the world. You've seen, I mean, this, this music has really, uh, the return it's paid on the investment is like unbelievable, right? Yeah, I can't complain. A good business decision to get into this business. I guess so, yeah. Okay. I mean, it's, it has satisfied my, uh, what I, you know, most of my desires, I would say. Right. Most That's of the stuff that I do now, I would say, is sort of along the lines of what I want to do based on purely musical considerations. If I wanted to make money, if that was my main thing, I would have gone into finance or become a doctor or something like right. that, or just been a, a pop songwriter to try to make yeah. huge amounts of bread. That's not why I became a musician. Okay. That's not why I'm, I'm in the profession of music. I'm into it, I think, um, for, for musical reasons. And I'm into music for all kinds of reasons that I would, you know, at the risk of sounding a little corny for the, the you know, the spiritual side of it, you know? The, it's, it's, it's deeply, deeply rewarding in a, in a sort of mystifying way. The, the training that you went, the hard work that you put into it without taking the shortcuts and, you know, that has paid off and allowed, has been a, it sounds like it's been a big factor in allowing you to, you know, I think make so. Musical yeah. decisions. Yeah. That yeah. You make. I mean, like any freelance career, it it there are challenges in freelancing, you know, and that it's right. not, you know, I've been incredibly um, fortunate, I think, to have worked as consistently and as much as I have, and um, so that's amazing. But you know, there having a, a regular income all the time is something. I mean, any musician who does it. For their whole life, will tell you that it's you know it's it's <laughs> fluctuates. up and down. It fluctuates <laughs> yeah. from a business perspective. Is that the product is music? It's a product, right? Right, and it's it's going to be sold. There's money changing hands, whether it's money that comes to me or money that a record buyer is paying to a right. thing. It's a business, you know. A product like paper towels. The product is something that probably involves a little bit more of personal heart and soul and all of this stuff that's maybe not wrapped up in making an air conditioner. You are trying to take this thing, which is ostensibly the result of your experience in music and maybe, you know, to lesser and greater extents, a sort of spiritual involvement in this art and, and your expression, turn that into something that you can sell. Sonny Rollins, you know Sonny Rollins, yeah. right? Very, at any point in his, his career, I think he would be described as being well recognized and successful in the yeah, late sure. 50s, early 60s. He took like a, I don't remember exactly what it was, like a year or two off music. And he would go out supposedly, I think it's true, to the Brooklyn Bridge and practice on the bridge. He made a record called The Bridge after he came out of this semi-retirement. And I think he did it because he, if I understood it correctly, he just was not happy with where he was at, you know, and he wanted to try to discover something else that he had that the determined the only way to do that was to maybe not have to fulfill all these professional obligations and just explore pure music for music's sake find out what he was looking for and then come back to it so there are sometimes i'm not saying that i've done anything like that in my own um, career but you know i always remember doing that and going wow this guy is just that's it, deep. Yeah, it's really, that's, yeah, yeah. that's committed, you know. Sure. And, and I never wanted to sound like anybody else. I'm not saying I sound like myself, but when I was growing up, if you heard somebody, you loved them, maybe you learned how they play, whether it was Hendrix or Wes Montgomery or both. But then at some point it was like, okay, I got to remove all of that because it's not me. And I don't want to be, not only for people that's who hear step, me, though, right? but for me, I don't want to, the inspiration that I, that, I act upon from a John Coltrane or Beethoven or whoever is not to sound like them, but the inspiration I get is that they sounded so much like themselves and so unlike anybody else. So true. That's yes. what I want to take away from that. What can I do to, to find that 
you know, kernel of myself in all of this. Professionally, that might be the highest compliment that you can give somebody. It I absolutely think, is, right? if you have your yeah. own sound. And also, as I said, in this ancillary way, it also, it, it heightens your ability to, to work. Because right. people hear you and they go, it's like the good club that guy said, it. you want Scott Phelan? You, they, you're the only place Talking somebody- Talking to the camera, say that. <laughs> it's the only place you can get Scott Phelan is like Scott Phelan. <laughs> On this roof. But, but if you don't do that and if you sound like some amalgam of 20 different people, it's like, oh, yeah, that guy kind of sounds right. like. And again, that's like what we were saying before about Ultimately, it comes down to your personality. If you're not willing to make sometimes what are very tough choices and to figure out what it is, who it is that you are, that indicates that you as a person are not willing to make those choices. And that's expressive of your personality. Right. Oh, you yeah. Know, you know, having a, a, a you know, 25, 30 year career in music of just doing music and for the most part playing the kind of music that I really right. love playing. I mean, Right, at the end of the day, the big picture is still a beautiful picture. I can't complain. Right? I mean, I could. Yeah, you've been blessed. I, Charmed life. You know, but you've worked hard for it. I know I've worked hard for it, and, I, it, and, I, and I thank you for saying so. But, you know, it's really with all the things that human beings do, you know, this is a pretty great thing to have been able to do. So I'm, You mean I'm really this lucky. interview here? This today? interview. <laughs> there you go. You've come all the way, man. Well, listen, Adam, I, I can't thank you enough, man. This has been an absolute pleasure, man. Thanks, you know, man. You're, you're one of the best best guitarists I've ever heard. Thanks, one of the best man. guys I ever met. Thank and, you, you know, so proud much. Proud to man. call you a friend, buddy. Thanks, man. I thank appreciate you. it.